Okay, so I think it's time to make a start. Um, so welcome everybody to this um, sixth edition of the MEI uh, network series. Um, and I, I'm Professor Sandberg from the um, University of Melbourne. I'm uh, also part of the Melbourne Energy Institute um, and, and um, in charge of the pro power generation and transport program. Um, before I start, I'd uh, like to um, acknowledge country. Um, so I'm speaking from the lands of the Forangeri, the Voi Burung and Boon Burung people um, who have been the custodians of this land for thousands of years. And I acknowledge and pay my respect um, to the elders past and present. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker of today, um, who is Associate Professor Simon Smart from the School of Chemical Engineering at the University of Queensland. And uh, Simon is Deputy Director of the Dow Center for Sustainable um, Engineering Innovation and an Associate Professor in the School of Chemical Engineering at the University of Queensland. He's also the Project Director for the Net Zero Australia Study, uh, which is in collaboration with the University of Melbourne, uh, the University of Queensland and Princeton University um, and Management Consultancy News Group. Um, his research is centered around the sustainable production and use of energy and chemicals, including development of enabling technologies and processes for the production of clean energy, materials and water. Um, so, Simon, I invite you to give your lecture and um, it's going to be about 40 minutes or so and we'll, we'll keep the Q&A until the end of the talk um, and, and then everybody gets an opportunity to um, ask questions. So over to you, Simon. Thanks very much, Richard, and I hope everybody can hear me and I'm just going to share my slides. Uh, and I hope everybody can see that now. Yeah, all good. Excellent. Okay, so um, thank you very much for having me. It's a, a pleasure to talk at this uh, MEI Network uh, webinar. Um, I apologize, I can't be there in person. I'm actually um, in the US at the moment, um, which means that when I'd also like to um, acknowledge um, the traditional lands on which we, the owners of the traditional lands on which we meet today. Um, the majority of the work that I'm gonna present uh, was done in Brisbane. Um, so I'd like to pay respects to the Tugaral and Jogara people uh, and their uh, ancestors and descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to the country. Um, but also I'm at Stanford at the moment, which is the ancestral lands of the Mukwema and Alahone tribe. Um, and so I'd like to acknowledge their contributions, um, particularly to the, uh, the area of San Francisco. Um, so I have been asked to talk about uh, blue hydrogen as an alternative for natural gas, I think was the, the title of the, um, the talk. But I thought I might um, start with um, comments around Hydrogen, the molecule of many, many colors. It's a, clearly a colorless gas, a colorless, odorless gas, but it's a it has a, a range of colors that have um, uh, been brought up in uh, recent times as we have, as the focus has shifted towards um, decarbonization uh, and the energy transition. Um, so just a reminder that when I talk about uh, blue hydrogen, we're talking about either natural gas or coal um, with carbon capture and storage. I'm also, if I have time, gonna sneak a little bit on turquoise hydrogen, which is around methane pyrolysis. Um, and I think it's turquoise because it's not quite blue and it's not quite green and that's the color in between. Um, and then I've added in a couple of other colors in there around nuclear hydrogen and solar hydrogen. And uh, I learned today that there's also, some people refer to white hydrogen as the naturally occurring hydrogen. So it keeps gaining in terms of colors. Oops. Um, so on the next slide. So I thought I'd also like to set the scene before diving into some of the technical details and uh, I'll focus the talk around um, production of blue hydrogen, some of the, um, I guess, you know, technical flow sheets, um, you know, fundamental reasons why we choose to do things and then the performance um, and economics of several different processes across the, the blue hydrogen spectrum. But I thought I'd just like to lay out from the beginning um, potential size of the hydrogen opportunity. Um, so we have here some, uh, and some shameless, shameless cross, cross promotion of our Net Zero Australia project. 
um, which basically looks at decarbonisation pathways for the domestic and export economy for Australia. Um, and if we consider the export economy and we want to replace all of our coal and LNG exports with hydrogen or a clean hydrogen derivative uh, or carrier, then we're looking on the order of 140 odd million tonnes of hydrogen a year um, by the end. Um, in some of the scenarios that we've modelled in that, we're, we're talking about blue hydrogen and others we're talking about green. Um, and I just sort of wanted to highlight, um, you know, the potential uh, opportunity within Australia if we, as people begin to talk about or continue to talk about um, a hydrogen as a superpower. Uh, sorry, Australia as a hydrogen superpower. So um, let's get into it. Um, in terms of the, the first one up off the, the first cab off the rank, blue hydrogen from coal. Um, and so the work that I'm gonna present um, stems from a project funded by the Future Fuel CRC, uh, where we looked into uh, a very broad range actually of um, different pathways for making hydrogen and performed a series of process modeling and techno-economic analysis of those um, different pathways. So I'm gonna present a couple of different cases for um, blue hydrogen from coal, blue hydrogen from natural gas and blue hydrogen and turquoise hydrogen via methane pyrolysis. So a lot of information, very happy to take questions at the end. So in terms of the, I guess the different, uh, uh, not drivers, but um, uh, different options that we'll be looking at here. So one of them is the type of coal that we look at. So we've got a black coal from Queensland and a brown coal from Victoria. Looked at two different types of um, gasifiers, one an entrained flow that looks at steam and a, a fluidized bed that looks at steam and oxygen. And then the traditional um, CO2 capture, sort of amine based capture versus an in-situ carbonization approach as well, just to get a flavor of blue hydrogen across uh, from coal. So what do I mean when I talk about gasification? Because that's the process that we talk about when we are thinking about um, extracting blue hydrogen from coal. Um, well, gasification is the addition of heat uh, and some sort of oxidant in a limiting amount um, at the usually very high temperatures and moderate to high pressures. Uh, and it's, we do those things to break down coal. It also works for biomass into a syngas and that sometimes we also might break down into some tars and generally there'll also be some ash left over. But generally what we're primarily after is this syngas, hydrogen and some oxides of carbon, which we're going to shift cr to create some more hydrogen. Um, and these processes are already, the gasifiers are already um, well commercialized around the world. Um, you might have seen coal to liquid fuels or coal to chemicals or coal to X. Um, so these gasifiers already do exist around the place. And the ones that we focused on were, one was an entrained bed uh, and the other was a dual fluidized bed where the, um, the in, this, it's in this particular diagram, which I stole, um, it's got biomass, but you can imagine coal um, flowing around uh, the dual fluidized bed with uh, various heating zones um, and cooling zones. So that's what we're, there are also, of course, fixed bed gasifiers and other sorts of fluidized bed gasifiers. Um, we chose these as the most appropriate for the coals um, that we were looking at, that Queensland black coal and the Victorian brown coal. So very briefly, because I could put a whole range of um, a very detailed process flow sheets up, but let's let's think about this very briefly. What does it mean for steam gasification? So this is where we're gasifying coal using steam as the oxidant. So this is where the oxygen comes in that's going to break down the, the coal and the tars into um, that syngas mixture. So we've always got some pretreatment. We're adding steam indirectly um, into the steam gasifier. We take that, uh, that syngas mixture and we react the carbon monoxide with water to produce extra hydrogen and more carbon dioxide. And then we separate out the carbon dioxide, um, which we would then want to um, 
put into a pipeline. Um, and the hydrogen comes out of, we take the, the hydrogen out of the acid gas or the CO2 capture unit and we purify it further into a hydrogen product. There can also be some um, uh, indirect heating in some cases. And so there may require to be a second CO2 removal unit um, if, we're, if we're heating some of the coal. Rather than directly doing all the heating inside the gasifier, we might provide a bit of extra heat there. So there's actually two sources for CO2 removal. Um, the in-situ gasification uh, step basically knocks out um, the carbon capture and water gas shift units and replaces it with um, a process where we're um, doing in-situ capture of, um, of CO2 using calcium carbonate. In the uh, oxygen cases, the steam oxygen cases, we're feeding in both um, steam and oxygen, oxygen coming from an air separation unit. Um, and this is um, to do uh, more of the heating inside the, the gasifier itself. We've still got our, um, our water uh, gas shift and we've still got our uh, CO2 capture unit. Um, in order to generate the steam, we're going to be burning something. Um, so that's going to generate some flue gas, uh, which also needs a second CO2 removal unit. So effectively, you know, we've added in an air separation unit. So we're, 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 we're dealing with a mixture of steam and, and oxygen, um, different to the, the first processes that I described. Okay, and I now have a scrolling wheel on my screen, which is problematic. Let's just hope that it stops doing that. And so, so Simon, we can't see it. So from our side. Oh, there we go. Right? Okay, did it come across? Did it change slides now for you? Yes, it has. Okay, excellent. Sorry, it was just clearly just thinking. So um, it's finished thinking. So. Let's have a look at the uh, performance comparison though then. And so, because I've got a, quite a few cases to get through, um, we'll go fairly quickly through them and then we can have some questions afterwards. Um, so here I've got our four cases. We've got um, the black coal is really only useful in the steam and oxygen case. Um, it's, it's not well suited to the, um, to the entrained flow. Uh, it's not well suited to the, to the steam on the gasifier case, sorry. Um, and um, in terms of comparison, I think the main areas for comparison are looking at where the, the CO2 is captured from, so both from the syngas and from the flue gas. And I think it's important to note that in both, in these instances, we need a couple of um, CO2 capture units separated because the conditions, uh, the different pressures um, of, the gas, of the gas streams um, it's necessary to do these in, in separate capture units. You can't just combine the two streams. Um, and so looking at, and also the, um, the net process efficiency there. So in terms of the CO2 intensity, uh, I guess on the plus side, we've taken what would be a process where we've got on the order of around about 20 tons of CO2 emitted for every ton of hydrogen that we make. And we're getting down to somewhere around the one or less than one um, with a highly optimized CCS process um, in our process flow modeling. Um, we can also look then at the um, overall energy efficiency with the um, Victorian brown coal through the steam and oxygen gasifier um, coming out. Uh, on top in terms of process efficiency there. Although there's, there's only a few percentage points in it um, across the, um, the various schemes. If we model that through to the um, installed equipment and total investment costs. Um, so we've got our Queensland black coal, Victorian brown with the entrained flow, Victorian brown coal with the dual fluidized bed and the Victorian brown coal with the in-situ carbon capture. What we see is that the CO2 capture, dehydration and storage is around about, so that is the um, 
this turquoisey color, the brown color, and the dark, dark blue color. It's around about um, uh, it says a half there, but I think it's actually a little bit less than a half of the um, the total equipment cost. It's probably more like thirty to forty percent of the total equipment installed equipment cost. Um, the in situ CO2 capture, this one over here, requires fewer units. Um, so it has a lower capex, although arguably it comes with a higher um, degree of technological risk and a lower TRL. Um, this essentially lays out some of our assumptions around contingency and working capital rate based on what um, the installed equipment cost here is in terms of the blue um, versus some of the other um, outside battery limits and contingencies and, and working capital costs that come from um, actual installation of a plant for the total investment cost breakdown. How does that actually translate to levelized costs? Um, what, it, what we find from it uh, um, is this uh, chart on the right here where um, the coal cost comes in in the dark blue here, the capital cost comes in in the purple, um, fixed operational cost comes in in the green and other variable costs come in in the red. Um, we see that the Victoria brown coal and the entrained flow um, gasifier um, comes in at, um, at the lowest overall cost. So that's with the steam oxygen, um, the steam oxygen gasifier there. And then we did a little bit of a sensitivity analysis around that um, and find that um, CapEx is the largest driver. Oops, sorry. CapEx is the largest driver there of cost. Um, the electricity price does play um, some role there, and we've varied the CapEx plus or minus, so minus 30% plus 50%, and the electricity price ranging from a rather optimistic $25 a megawatt hour at these days um, up to 128 and with a, a standard around 80 and then we've also varied the CO2 cost in terms of storage per ton. Um, and so that for a break even price of $4.01 uh, in the base case, um, if we look at uh, the CapEx has the largest influence on cost there. Um, in terms of sensitivity analysis, um, effectively, the uh, obviously the CapEx variation is um, the highest, and so if we have a, um, we can we can get down to almost three dollars, three dollars thirty, um, using the Victorian brown coal in an entrained flow gasifier, and that the coal price has a much, unsurprisingly, I guess, um, given the base case of cost of the feedstock, um, coal price has a bigger influence on black coal than it does on brown coal processes. So moving. Um, fairly quickly then into blue hydrogen from natural gas. Um, here we've um, compared um, steam methane reforming and autothermal reforming. Um, and in some instances, we've gone to maximize process efficiency and in others, we've tried to maximize CCS capture. So this is our traditional gray hydrogen. Um, we've got a couple of variants of steam methane reforming. Um, one where we have a, a simple single steam methane reformer, another where we have a combined reformer. Um, and this, we have indirect heating, um, so heating from the outside, burning um, methane to heat the reformer tubes, and then the steam methane reforming happens inside the reformer tubes. So we actually have two sources of CO2, whereas an autothermal reformer actually does partial oxidation of the um, natural gas inside the combustion chamber to provide the heat to, to do the um, reforming reaction. So this is a direct heating process you, and fed with oxygen typically. And there's a couple of different, uh, uh, you know, these have sort of been optimized for various production processes as they stand. Um, but let's have a look at what that means when we add CCS to them. So when we add um, steam methane reforming, We've got a couple of options here. So in the, I guess the main things to point out here, again, we've got the, you know, the reforming reactions, um, the water gas shift. We're providing natural gas to heat the reformers. So that means we actually need two capture units, again, because um, one's at low pressure and the other's at high pressure. 
So we can't just combine those two streams together. We've got to have two separate bits of capital. And then the combined reformer adds in uh, a bit of air separation to feed oxygen in um, into the, uh, the combined SMR. If we look at autothermal reforming, uh, here we've got an air separation unit going into the uh, autothermal reformer. Um, we uh, have the option of having, so because we're um, recycling our tail gas, which will have some um, methane in it um, to do steam generation from the, from the um, off gas from the hydrogen purification section. Um, we again can have, if we want to maximize capture, um, we can have two separate capture units there. Whereas if we want to maximize efficiency, um, we might forego this second much smaller um, capture unit and focus only on capture from the um, from the main autothermal reformer, just from the main syn gas. In terms of what that looks like, um, so again, I guess we're comparing CO2 intensity here. So again, we've taken what a process of what was um, around about 10 tons of CO2 per ton of hydrogen. And with CO2 capture, we've dropped it down to around about 0.75 to one and a bit tons of CO2 per ton of hydrogen, depending on the process configuration that we've got there. Um, and you can see here the, the maximum efficiency is, is higher than we would get out of um, than we got out of the coal process. Um, but we do have a slightly higher um, CO2 intensity uh, resulting from, I guess, the, the decision not to capture that um, second much smaller stream of CO2. In terms of how that translates into installed equipment costs, um, so obviously, so again, here we've got our um, CO2 removal from syngas. We've got our CO2 dehydration compression in the, in the green and the blue stages. Um, we've got CO2 removal from our flue gas in the, in the darker green there. Um, and so we can see that the, um, the capex increases with the capture rate. Um, the uh, autothermal reformer has the lowest um, CO2 capture cost um, related to the um, easier, I guess the fact that it's, it's easier to capture the CO2 um, from the direct heating process, capture the majority of it directly from the, um, the syngas stream. And there's a smaller cleanup on the flue gas. Um, sorry, there's a small, yeah, there's a smaller cleanup on the flue gas. Um, and at this scale, um, the ATR competes with um, just plain vanilla SMR. Um, if we don't consider the full capture, we just go after the maximum efficiency. We know that as we go to larger sizes, um, ATR becomes um, a preferred, a better technology or a more cost-effective technology for, for integration with CCS than what uh, SMR does. What that translates to in terms of a levelized cost of hydrogen um, is we have, um, I just want to, so using here, we've used a natural gas price of $6 a gigajoule. Um, we can see that the, um, they're, they're all hovering around the three, the 2.9 to $3, $3.10 um, a kilogram of hydrogen. Um, and that uh, the natural gas price forms a significant portion of that, um, as does the capital cost, I guess, unsurprisingly. Um, so CapEx and natural gas have a fairly large uh, influence on the cost. Um, and that, you know, based on a fairly low natural gas price and an optimistic CapEx assumption, we're on the order of the $2 um, a kilogram targets that folks have talked about for a while. Uh, in terms of the uh, natural uh, blue hydrogen from natural gas. Um, yeah, and so if, we, um, if we're looking to achieve that $2 a kilo target and we look at both um, low natural gas prices and um, I guess CapEx reductions that might result from doing lots of projects uh, within Australia or adapting 
very effectively learnings from other projects around the place, particularly as it comes to CCS. Um, both those things are required in order to get our under two dollars a kilo for, for for blue hydrogen. And as I said, we know that at larger scales, this was done at a hundred thousand tons a year. But if we go up around the three hundred, four hundred thousand tons a year, then we're looking at an autothermal reforming process um, being more competitive than a SMR. Um, and the last one that I wanted to talk about, and I think I've still got a bit of time, so um, is around turquoise hydrogen from methane pyrolysis. So this is a process that um, is not, um, I guess there's some folks around the world who are looking to um, commercialize this technology. Um, it's only been really in the um, demonstration scale. So within Australia, I think Hazer is probably the most well-known um, case for, um, for, for methane pyrolysis. Uh, in America, which is where I am, um, recently the US DOE loans program has uh, one of the two projects that they've funded is a, um, is a methane pyrolysis process um, from monolith technologies uses a different technology to the ones that we've considered here. It uses a plasma one, but um, I guess it's uh, increasingly gaining in, in, in focus as folks think of decarbonizing natural gas. So we've gone with a couple of different options here, one around using bubbling uh, molten liquids and the other using hot fluidized beds. And there's a couple of different ways that we can supply the heat into the pyrolysis reaction. So what is pyrolysis? Um, it's basically cracking methane with heat and no oxygen. Um, why would we do that? Well, we get to produce solid carbon um, and hydrogen. Now we don't get as much hydrogen as we would from a natural gas reforming process, um, largely because we're not feeding in uh, water the, uh, as an extra source of hydrogen into the, into the reaction. Um, and unlike methane reforming, which can actually be a, um, an energy positive process when you consider making use of some of the excess steam that's generated, um, this is definitely an endothermic process. So where this is an energy consuming process, might use on the order of 20, 25% of the energy that you produce in order to um, provide the heat to run the reaction. The reaction might run from depending on how well you do your, your catalyst from, say, um, well, actually before today, I would have said anywhere from 800 to 1200 degrees C. Um, just listened to a presentation this afternoon from some folks at Berkeley National Labs where they might've gotten uh, temperatures well below the, uh, the 700 degrees, which is really quite fascinating if they've managed to achieve that. Um, so what normally happens is you do it on a solid catalyst, which is problematic because you form carbon that cokes up all your catalyst surfaces, reflects you, restricts your gas flow through the reactors. Um, and the only way to get rid of it, or the best way to get rid of it is by burning it, which makes CO2, which defeats the whole purpose. Um, so it's a pretty effective way of making carbon, but it's not a very effective way of making hydrogen, at least traditionally. So there are a couple of ways that folks have thought about doing this in a better way. So one is uh, the hazer, well, something similar to a hazer, pro hazer, hazer process, which is basically a fluidized bed um, where you're passing uh, gas through uh, a fluidized bed of particles, catalyst particles, um, and you're separate, you're um, recycling those catalyst particles, or you might actually consume some of the catalyst um, and make carbons out of it. Um, and you're making a mixture of methane and hydrogen. The other one, uh, which is where some of my own experimental research has been is around um, bubbling the methane through uh, a, a, a column of molten liquid that might be molten salt or a molten metal um, to get some, the, the advantage there is that the carbon effectively floats. You don't get to, you don't have to coke up your catalyst and you can, um, you're just doing a, a relatively simple um, solid liquid separation at least as simple as a separation can be at um, say 900 to a thousand degrees. 
Um, certainly, the the solid catalyst process is uh, more commercialized at the moment, um, uh, and Hayes is building a uh, or have built a, a demonstration plant over in Perth based uh, on similar style technology. Um, there are a few folks around the world, C zero in um, in California, who are commercializing a process similar to the molten media one. So. Let's get both up on the screen here to see what they look like. Um, uh, I guess the main parts are here that we've got a, um, we're providing heat indirectly into the reactor. Um, so we're actually gonna be using some of the tail gas as the furnace uh, to, to heat the furnace to provide heat into the reactor, <coughs> excuse me. Um, now some of that tail gas will mean if you're burning some of that tail gas to, cre to create the, um, the heat for the pyrolysis process, then you're going to need CO2 capture in order to make it um, very low carbon. Um, so we've added that in there. Um, and it's a similar story for the, um, for the uh, slurry bubble column or the, the molten salt bu bubble column. Um, because again, we're using um, some of the tail gas to heat the molten salt um, which necessitates CO2 capture to avoid um, creating excess emissions there. Um, an interesting option from this one at any rate is that you could also, if you were interested in just injecting a mixture of methane and hydrogen into a pipeline for blending purposes, and folks have been talking about blending hydrogen into pipelines for a while, you could do away with this hydrogen purification step here. And that would mean that you're, um, reducing, um, you'd have to provide the heat elsewhere, um, or you'd have to burn some of, of your um, gas that comes off. So you'd still have your CO2 emissions, but you'd, you'd get away from the hydrogen purification step, um, but you'd, made a, you'd make a mixed product if you did. Um, there's also options of integrating these with renewable energy to avoid um, having to burn that, that uh, tail gas for the heat. And that might be in the form of electrical heating. Um, it's probably not solar thermal. The temperatures needed are a little outside of what solar thermal could do at the moment. Um, but there's a couple of different versions there where we could use renewable energy and electrical heating to generate um, the heat required for the reaction. If we look through at our, our performance, um, we can see that um, so the CO2 intensity, I think is probably, so you can see here in terms of the byproduct carbon. So that the carbon that we make is actually a, um, uh, it, it can range from sort of a carbon black material um, all the way through to, I guess, more high value carbon products, depending on the, the chemistry and the cat catalyst used in the reaction. Um, I think at this stage, the majority of the focus has been on a, creating some value with the carbon um, so that it's not just a, a material that you might include in, in low value as a low value filler, but actually um, getting value from it because you're making for every ton of hydrogen, you're making, you know, on the order of, um, you know, three to three and a half uh, tons of carbon from the process. Um, in terms of the CO2 intensity, we're on the order of in all cases, except for one of them were on the order of um, less than a ton of CO2 per ton of hydrogen. Um, and that comes from the process of um, providing the heat through the tail gas. Um, and obviously we get down to a lower level. So in this case, there's no CO2 capture employed at all. And we're still down at the level of the SMR uh, or sorry, the, the ATR optimized for efficiency. The overall net energy efficiency is lower than um, either of the conventional natural gas, blue hydrogen processes, um, which is also unsurprising because the pyrolysis reaction consumes energy, whereas, as I said before, the, the SMR process uh, can be net positive if you do your heat integration and steam generation properly. Um, so this is just a little bit of a, a comparison between them, um, effectively, um, we're able to generate lower emissions and we're able to do it um, independent of CCS um, with the emerging technologies here, this pyrolysis process. We do need more natural gas because that's where our hydrogen comes from. There's no water to sort of supplement the hydrogen that, that comes from the natural gas. 
we've got a lower process efficiency and we may be able to, certainly in area for future research, utilize some renewable electricity for heating uh, rather than using natural gas or hydrogen. What does that translate to in terms of costs? Um, unsurprisingly, some higher levelized costs of hydrogen than what we would see for um, conventional SMR um, on the order of around the $4 a kilogram of hydrogen. Um, we included a slightly larger contingency in these studies because of the low TRL, so the low technology readiness levels. Um, this one here is a little bit of an anomaly. This is the um, hydrogen methane blend. So it's hard to compare on a dollars per kilogram of hydrogen basis um, because you're actually producing an impure hydrogen stream. But uh, yeah, so it, but it's an interesting product. If you are considering blending, you get to save significantly on your, in particular, capital costs um, uh, in order because you don't have as much separation there. The main economic drivers are unsurprisingly um, the capex and the natural gas. But if you are able to make high value carbon, then that's a, a real game changer. So our default value is $50 a tonne for the carbon that we make. Um, if we take no value for the carbon, then it pushes us out to um, $4.10. Um, if we take $500, so an order of magnitude difference for the carbon, then we can drop down into the the mid $2, $2.60. Um, so if we can create high value carbon, then this process, then that can become a game changer for the economics of the methane pyrolysis process. Um, if we want to look at the sensitivity analysis, obviously a high natural gas price uh, is going to have a big impact on the process here. So the process economics are less plausible under high natural gas prices. Um, in particular, because you've got a higher natural gas consumption. Um, and as I said, a high quality byproduct of a carbon byproduct um, drives us down towards the, the $2 a kilo target price, although it doesn't get us all the way there. So I think I'm coming close to my 40 minutes of time. So I guess some final thoughts um, are that technology learning curves will be pretty essential to all of this. Um, these are just some indicative results. I'm not suggesting that any of these learning rates are necessarily what will happen in the industry. Um, but if we sort of look at some of those emerging technologies around solid catalysts and molten metal uh, processes for um, uh, methane pyrolysis, then with high learning rates um, through, I guess, lots of very effective technology deployment, um, then the emerging technologies become competitive with the conventional technologies um, at a low natural gas price. And so I guess my final thought for all of it is that based on our uh, study, and I will have to say that we completed the study before um, the Ukraine situation, uh, Russia's war with Ukraine happened and the energy um, crisis hit and so the concept of you know more than ten dollars a, a gigajoule for natural gas wasn't really considered in the context of this study and so when you have um, low cost natural gas then natural gas is probably the most promising pathway for blue hydrogen um, but it only it only works out at low natural gas prices and with that I'd like to acknowledge all the great people who did the work. Uh, in particular, uh, Moshkin Tabai and Tara Hassini, Moshkin from UQ and Tara from University of Adelaide. Um, also, uh, great colleague Peter Ashman for the University of Adelaide. Um, some folks who've helped me with the write up, Jordan and Mark. And then, of course, acknowledge the funding from the Future Fuel CRC uh, for the, um, the work that went into the project. And with that, I might stop sharing my slides and um, very happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Simon. Um, that was great. Um, I have a few questions here in the Q&A. Um, I'm, I'm going to go through them in kind of, I guess, the order they came in. Um, the, the first question was, does the black coal option incorporate the upstream fugitive emissions? 
um, it, it appears not to, which is deceptive. So that's an excellent point. Um, and I would say that none of the, um, so the, there are only process emissions that I've considered and what I've named in the, um, in the study here. So both for natural gas and for coal, the um, upstream life cycle emissions, uh, which will largely be methane leakage or fugitive emissions of methane, have not, be con have not been considered. And so, yes, the, um, the quality of the upstream infrastructure for minimising those emissions um, becomes crucial as we start to think about, um, you know, the real impact of, of something like a blue hydrogen. So it's an excellent point, yes. Okay, um, I have another question here, which is on the impact of the blue hydrogen generation on the limited water sources in Australia. So that is an excellent question, actually. Um, and it may have been, so in the steam methane reforming slide, um, where on the order of, it was sort of under the total steam um, chart. So you're on the order of between about 15 and maybe 22 um, tonnes of water per tonne of hydrogen, um, which is reasonably water intensive. Um, uh, green electrolysis is on the order of, um, I guess if we want to consider a super efficient process, 10 tonnes of water per tonne of hydrogen. Um, so yeah, water is a concern. Um, I guess my thoughts around water at the moment are that the water supply need not be taking groundwater sources, um, that actually we could consider, um, particularly if we're looking at an export industry, um, we could consider desalinated water, um, which is uh, the energy requirement for the desalinated water versus the um, actual energy requirement for making the hydrogen. Certainly for green hydrogen, it's it's on the order of 1% or less. Um, so it is a, it's, and it would be a climate resilient way of making water for these processes. So if you're just gonna do it in a dry area and you just wanna consider groundwater sources, then absolutely, I think great care needs to be taken. If we are gonna consider climate resilient water solutions like desalination or recycled water, for example, depending on where you are on the continent, um, then I think that can be appropriately managed. Okay, um, I, I've got two follow-up questions that basically uh, address these first two points. Um, so the first one is brown coal has virtually no fugitive methane emissions and is self-sufficient as far as water goes. Um, could you comment on that? Yeah, so we actually, um, yeah, so the, <laughs> yes, um, the fugitive emissions from, from the brown coal are, are different. So the fugitive emissions from each of the feedstocks are different. And as I said, I don't have those numbers to hand right now. Um, but yeah, they, they need to be taken into consideration when we're talking about the um, the overall life cycle emissions of the process. As I said, I just pre presented the, um, the process ones. Um, and on the water part of that question, which I think I saw was that the, um, yeah, we, we, brown coal is interesting because you actually end up drying, um, brown coal is very wet and you dry it and then you put it in the gasifier and you mix it back with um, steam again. But that's, it seems counterintuitive, but it's the, it's the way in which to do it. Um, so yeah, the water requirement for uh, brown coal classification is um, less strenuous than it might be for some of the other processes. Okay, um, I've got another question related to the price here, and, and, and I guess you already made this disclaimer towards the end that uh, you know some of the prices might have to be kind of recalculated. But uh, I guess the question really is, how, how do these prices compare to the green hydrogen that is being produced? Uh, for example, in Adelaide by Hydrogen Park, South Australia, electrolyzers. Yeah, so they're great questions. Um, part of this study, and I haven't presented them here um, because we focused on green, on, on blue hydrogen for this particular talk, was also to look at green hydrogen numbers. Um, the, the green hydrogen numbers are changing all the time. Um, so uh, 
uh, in the sense that as we deploy more, the cost of the, the CapEx comes down, we get better at deploying it. Um, that's offset uh, in a lot of ways in a country like Australia with high electricity prices, um, which we've seen over the last little bit. So not only have we had high gas prices, we've also had high electricity prices, which hurts the economics of some of these things unless we can sort of work out nice renewable deals in, in the meantime. Um, all the information that I've seen at the moment, including the work that we did for this project and what we've done for Net Zero Australia and what I've seen um, in other bits of news here and internationally is that green hydrogen costs are coming down, but they're still not at this moment competitive with blue hydrogen. Um, they're still uh, sort of upwards of, Oh, it's hard. I, I don't want to put a number on it because it. I'll say upwards of five or six dollars, which you know may drop down to four dollars depending on prices of electricity and some of the assumptions that folks use around it. Yeah. And in terms of the yeah, the next one with the natural gas unrealistically low, yes, um, at forty dollars a gigajoule or twenty dollars a gigajoule, then the numbers look much much worse for natural gas. What I will comment and what I wanted to raise about the pyrolysis process being one of the funded things from the US Department, uh, the US DOE loans office, um, was that that's a fairly that's a fairly big bet on from the US DOE on um, methane pyrolysis as a process. Um, they get a pretty stringent set of criteria, and they also have a pretty low natural gas price. So I think that says a few things there in terms of um, what they think of the economics of it. Okay, um, moving to uh, the CCS part here, um, there's a comment that some reports about CCS operations, for example, Shell Quest say that it actually emits more carbon than it captures. Are we too optimistic about the carbon capture rate? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I don't, uh, and I think it's a, I'm not sure how to qualify too optimistic or not. Um, certainly, I, I think um, there's, I think CCS is a fairly polarized space. I think there's some very optimistic assumptions and some very pessimistic assumptions. And I think the reality sits somewhere between them. Um, we modeled, uh, in this case, some fairly high capture rates. Um, rates that we think are plausible, um, but rates that haven't necessarily been demonstrated. Um, in order to, so yeah, I think there is a risk there in terms of us not being able to technically achieve those rates. But then I think there are also risks associated with, um, you know, not being able to achieve the various um, cost reductions or efficiency improvements that we might need for the for green hydrogen as well. I think. For me, I think steps that take us in the direction of low, in, increasingly low carbon hydrogen uh, are all useful steps to take. Okay, um, at the moment, there's one more question, which is, um, could you comment on the difference in efficiencies between the four coal cases? That is an excellent question that's gonna test my uh, because that was actually the work that was done by the University of South Australia and Tara, uh, Dr. Tara Hassini did that great work. Um, so I, other than to say that those, the numbers were what they were and that the Victorian brown coal with the steam and oxygen gasifier came in slightly higher um, in comparison to some of the other processes, um, I'm not sure I can say much more than that. Um, we do have a few reports out in the space um, and we will be having some more reports soon around this project. Um, so I'll probably direct those questions uh, around the, the technical details of the, um, the efficiencies for those processes to those reports. Happy to follow up with um, if, if people want uh, some more information on that. I just don't have it to hand and it was done by other folks in our team. Okay, just another one that's come in here. Um, how does the carbon intensity of renewable hydrogen compare to the figures presented here? 
So that's a bit of a how long is a piece of string question um, in that it depends on the renewable. Um, I suppose it depends on the mix of electricity that's going into the renewable um, process. Um, if we go with full renewables, then the only emissions are gonna be associated with any leaks of hydrogen. Hydrogen actually has a global warming potential in and of itself of around six compared to, um, compared to CO2 um, from what I've seen in the literature. So there, there will be some of that, but that will be true for all of the processes. Um, I guess the, the green hydrogen from fully electrolyte from full renewable electrolysis, um, if we don't take into account full life cycle emissions, um, it's probably very close to zero versus um, somewhere probably closer to one ton per, per ton. Okay, so at the moment, I can't see any more um, questions in the Q&A. If, if anybody has any more questions they want to ask Simon, um, please type them into the Q&A so that I can kind of um, present them to him. Well, this looks, looks like you've answered all the questions. So I'll just give it a few more um, seconds or maybe a minute or two for people to think of a final question uh, before we close this webinar. Um, while folks are um, thinking of any questions to ask, one thing, one comment that I will make from, I guess, a week and a half in the US is an interesting difference in perceived language here. It's been much more about the level of decarbonization on the hydrogen than it has been about the colors of hydrogen um, for the US versus the, what I'm used to talking about in Australia. So that's just an interesting observation. And I don't know how much of that has come about through the, um, the new Inflation Reduction Act and the, um, the previous bipartisan infrastructure of the bill um, sort of spurring development in, in these decarbonized forms of hydrogen. Why do I think pyrolysis is being backed by the DOE? Um, I think it's a process that makes sense at um, low natural gas prices. And the US is one of the few nations or few places around the world where that can happen. Um, and I do think that, um, so I think it makes sense in those cases. I also think that the monolith process in particular produces some um, high value carbons. Um, probably more consistently than some of the other processes have. Um, and so I think it has a couple of, it has a, an intermediate revenue stream there as well. So not privy to the reasons for the deliberation, but if I had to guess, that's what I'd say that I think it's a, it's a, it's a sensible process as long as you've got cheap natural gas. Okay, well, uh, there's more coming in here now. Um, we've got one question on what is, the next research focus to progress, I guess, towards lower cost hydrogen. Um, I think that's an excellent question. Um, I think deployment of various technologies will bring costs down um, because we'll learn as we go. I do think that, um, but to get deployment, we're going to need uh, end users to uh, and and users of hydrogen or potential users of hydrogen to actually get into all the secondary users of hydrogen to get into offtake agreements. Um, uh, in particular, in Australia, in the US here, they've got ten million tons of hydrogen that they already use in their oil refineries and um, ammonia production facilities. So that's an easy easy ten million tons of demand. We don't have that in Australia. Um, so I think we're going to need some people to drive deployment through increased demand, which is a bit chicken and the egg, unfortunately. Yeah, I think there's a demand there question here too, um, which is basically on what are you seeing as the primary use of hydrogen being targeted in the US? Yeah, so the first use is the first case is definitely decarbonize the what they're already doing. So that's the, their oil refineries, which I think are about six million tons in their ammonia, which is like three or four for the total of ten. Um, that's 
definitely their first place. Um, the second one is there's a lot more talk around transport here um, uh, for the, you know, trucking in particular. Um, there's a lot of ports here in the US which are actually just inland ports. And so there's a lot of big trucking routes. So um, there's, uh, yeah, I think that the, the hydrogen for transport and, and I've seen a lot more development around refueling stations and the like here um, than in, in Australia. So I think they're the other things that they'll go after first. Yeah, and I think related to that, another question here, do, do you see export as a source of demand in Australia? Uh, I think so. Um, yeah, I think that the... Uh, yes, I do think that export will be a primary source of demand. Certainly, if we're going to be a, we, a hydrogen superpower, then it will be an export story. We, we're blessed with very, very excellent um, renewable resources. Uh, we're blessed with um, market questions aside and, and around natural gas. We're blessed with some great resources for green. We're blessed with some great resources for blue. Um, so we should be able to make some pretty low cost hydrogen, which should be attractive to a fair number of nations that we're trading partners with um, who might not have access to the similar quality resources and therefore low cost hydrogen. Okay. Um, another question about, I guess, the carbon um, that, that you would produce with uh, pyrolysis uh, you know is the market going to be overwhelmed if pyrolysis takes off and is there going to be too much carbon that is another excellent question um, i do think that that is potentially the case for some of the high value carbon products i think i mean you for every ton of hydrogen you're making three and a half to four tons of carbon um, so it, when you start talking hundreds of millions of tons, where you'd start talking tens or hundreds of millions of tons, that's a lot of carbon. Um, what it may also spur though, is development of um, new low cost carbon materials. So the, there's a lot of very good carbon products, carbon materials out there that are only employed in uh, high value or niche applications, um, primarily because it's it's high cost carbon, to make, it's, it's high cost to make those materials. So. If all of a sudden the market is flooded with low cost, um, you know, carbon with excellent properties that you can turn into things that we've always wanted to make, but have been too expensive to sort of make for the general market, then it could, and this is a very big could blue sky sort of stuff thinking here, but there, there could, it could open up the, open up the opportunity for um, additional markets in, in, in additional materials. Okay. Um, then I've got a, a question here on, um, I assume CapEx costs as they stand for both blue and green hydrogen require continuous operation. Um, green hydrogen should also be able to serve a demand response function in a renewable heavy grid, similar to batteries and pumped hydro. And I guess the question is, I'm wondering what kind of duty cycle is achievable and to that end, how relevant mean electricity prices are as opposed to solar weighted or wind weighted prices. Uh, and this is yeah more more related to green hydrogen production, I guess. Yeah, that's um that's an excellent question. Um, so for our our analysis, we we focused on yeah continuous operation with like I think it was about a ninety percent or ninety five percent utilization or availability capacity factor um, for the plants, so that you could compare on an on an even basis. Um, bringing in those additional demand side um, management functions, they add different levels of value um, that aren't as easily compared across a, a study like this. So certainly acknowledge that they um, there will be additional costs incurred in terms of that style of operation. Um, and that may come in terms of higher maintenance costs Like we already know that if you run the electrolyzers up and down really hard and ramp them up and down, then certainly all the material science folks that I talk to, you know, they're a little bit worried about how the, the, the materials are going to degrade as a result. So there are some trade-offs in that space. And I don't, so I think it's something that we need to investigate. Um, I don't think we have a clear answer on that yet because we just haven't deployed and run it in that sort of style enough yet. All right. Okay. And then there's a, 
One more question here on the price of CO2. Is that going to be an economic driver of blue hydrogen? That's an excellent question. Um, I think not, because I don't think anybody's going to put a price on CO2. But I do think that the tax credit that's being applied to the um, to the various and and to the tax credit that's being applied to the hydrogen production here in the U.S. through the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Bill um, or Inflation Reduction Act, I should say, um, I think that is actually likely to spur um, some. That that's far more likely to spur investment in in hydrogen than than a CO two price both blue and green because it's a sliding scale from level of decarbonisation and you only have to get down. I think it's under something like one and a quarter tonnes per tonne in order to um, get the highest level of tax credit there, which is up to $3 uh, a kilo, which makes some of these projects look, start to look pretty attractive. Okay. Um, from your current USA trip, um, what, what is the status and learnings for decarbonization of heavy industry usage, uh, in particular for medium and high temperature heat? That's an excellent question, David, um, and one that I haven't heard talked about much at all. Um, just anecdotally had a dinner conversation with somebody who um, agreed that that actually wasn't a major focus of the, it was a very nascent sort of discussion here in the US at the moment. Um, and it, you know, we, we've got the Hilt CRC here. We've got some other lots of activities in in the high temperature, medium temperature heat space. Maybe an opportunity for Australia to sort of learn uh, to lead some of the research in that space around the world, because um, I think the US is much more focused on decarbonising existing um, industries and oh, decarbonising existing hydrogen, and then the transport seems to be their next big one. Um, so. But that's just all anecdotal stuff that I've just sort of observed. It's not a policy prescription by any means. Okay. Um, well, thanks again, Simon. I think you've um, talked with the second batch of questions really well there. Um, so let's give it a few more seconds. And if there's nothing else, then I think we can start kind of wrapping this up. Ah. Another few. Um, well, how big would the market for transport hydrogen be in the US? Oh, um, potentially really big if they focus on the trucking industry. Um, I, I don't have a number in my mind as to how large it would be, um, but it would be quite large if, if hydrogen for trucking became a major thing. I mean, is there any talk on uh, aviation as well? There is around sustainable aviation fuels, um, not not direct hydrogen, um, but using hydrogen to make sustainable aviation fuels for sure. Um, that is a that is a talk. There's also talks around um, marine fuels or, or maritime shipping fuels, essentially. Um, so, and probably more talk about liquid. Uh, organic carriers than I've seen in other places. But again, you know, talking to a fair few, fair few researchers. So, yeah. Yeah, maybe a follow up here as well. How, how is that fuel then going to be used? Is it going to be used through fuel cells or combustion in, on the transport I think, side? I think fuel cells. Um, and interestingly, I think uh, folks are starting to see the benefits too of. So, um, this is not just for transport, but also. Um, <laughs> There's a few of the supercomputers here that are looking at, and, and some of the data centers here that are looking at using hydrogen fuel cells um, to provide, uh, to be their power source, an interruptible power source, um, and actually combining them with having fuel cells combined with batteries to sort of look at, uh, I guess, more steady load and then peaking load um, on some of these things looks to be a reasonable combination of, of, um, of energy storage devices. Okay, um, can brown coal use be viable without other industries sharing the cost of pipeline and CCS? Ooh. Um, that's a good question. I think, 
I think who shares the cost of the infrastructure for the CCS and the um, for blue hydrogen is an excellent question. I'm not sure that the business models have um, an owner doing. So I think the storage, the transport, and the um, and the production probably have three separate business models. Um, there may be a given the monitoring requirements on some of the storage, there may be a requirement for some state owned entities there. Um, I think a lot of those details are still to be worked out though. So they're just my personal thoughts and observations there. Um, I, I think I think with a lot of these industries, there's there's going to be some people that are going to need to help share the costs of infrastructure. Not just for blue hydrogen, but for transmission infrastructure for green as well. Okay, maybe a final question here. When will the balance of ammonia be brought in? Um, I'm really sorry, but I'm not sure I understand that question. Yeah, I, I, I guess maybe generally what role ammonia is going to play? I, I don't know. So in terms of answering the question of what role ammonia is going to play, I think a fairly major one. Um, I think uh, it's got a lot of existing infrastructure, a lot of, uh, particularly for export for shipping. Um, I think it makes an awful lot of sense. Um, certainly the, the initial projects around the place in Australia at any rate, to, if we're thinking about moving it overseas to export, hydro, uh, uh, ammonia is a pretty um, sensible starting place. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think for some of the other applications, moving it around, um, Maybe ammonia is not the best, but um, I think it's a pretty sensible starting place. Okay, okay. Well, maybe one more final question <laughs> um, from the US. Was there much discussion about long duration energy storage and hydrogen potential through underground storage? Yeah, again, it's it's um, it was more of a discussion point than the high temperature industry um, question. Um, so certainly folks were starting to think about long duration energy storage, particularly um, the folks here in California. So um, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and um, were and Lawrence Livermore National Labs too are also doing some work around the, um, as well as some others, uh, I think maybe Sandia as well, um, doing the underground storage, looking at the underground storage question. Um, and that was also around, you know, replacing some of their natural gas um, storage bunkers with you know the potential for replacing them with hydrogen so that's it is being discussed in those terms um it was less of a it's less been less of a talking point than uh, i guess the production and the um and the transport side all right um well I think that brings us to the end. So th thank you very much, Simon, for an excellent talk and also for being so generous with your time. I know it's pretty late for you already um, in, in answering all these questions. So um, so big thank you from MEI. Um, and also thank you to everyone for joining another MEI Network Series webinar. Um, and yeah, with that, uh, we, we can close this session. So thanks again, Simon. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. And I um, yeah, really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, thanks. All right. Excellent. Well, take care and have a safe trip back. Will do. Thanks.